black thing go from left to right, and I thought, I'm going to die out here. No one's ever going to know. I couldn't believe what my eyeballs were showing me. I'll never forget how evil the eyes were. It was horrible. I mean, I've never seen nothing that evil. It ran towards me at a, at a rate that I, I, I can't even explain. Turned and stared at me. And this look of, I just want to kill you. I want to say it was human, but it wasn't. He was, he, was, he was yelling at me to grab a gun, grab a gun. I was like, for what? He said, just grab a gun. And there's footprints all the way to the door of my house. It had went inside my garage all the way to the door. 911, what are you reporting? Jesus Christ, you better... Sir? See ya. Hello? Get somebody out here. What's going on now, sir? That son of a bitch is about six foot nine, I don't know. Do you see him now, sir? Yes, I'm looking right at him. Uh-oh. You're listening to Sasquatch Chronicles. Check us out online at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you've had an encounter, email me. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. Got a great show planned for you tonight. Uh, Childhood encounters. I got two witnesses coming up. Ed, uh, who had an encounter when he was about 14 years old, and he saw one of these creatures digging on the side of a bank. Very, very fascinating encounter. And then I'll also be speaking to Jimmy, uh, who had uh, two encounters with these when he was a child. And uh, even it smashed in the back door. You'll want to stay tuned for that. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. And if you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, uh, you can get merchandise, additional shows. There's a daily blog. Uh, please check it out if you get a chance. How's everyone doing tonight? Uh, gosh, I can't believe this weekend's almost over with. It's about a million degrees here in the Pacific Northwest. Well, it might be a million and one. Uh, <laughs> it's hot, though. It's it's real hot here. And I hope wherever you're listening to the show, you're in a nice, cool place uh, to get ready for some encounters tonight. Let's jump into it. I want to welcome uh, Jimmy to the show. Jimmy, thanks for coming on. Absolutely, Wes. Thanks for having me. No, I appreciate it. I know you're on vacation. I appreciate you taking the time to come on. Uh, and, you know, when you and I were talking the other night, I was just blown away by the encounter, the two encounters that you had. Uh, if you would, for the audience, maybe kind of start from the beginning. Where where did all this take place, Jimmy? What state? This, this all took place in North Carolina. Um, I was probably, I want to say, maybe six or seven. I couldn't have been any much older than that. I'm 44 now. Um, my It's kind of relevant to the story just a little bit, but um, my, my mom wasn't the greatest mom. We moved around a lot, been to several schools in the same amount of year, you know, several schools and three or four schools in, in a year. We just moved around a lot. She was just in a nutshell, she was just a horrible, abusive mother. A um, lot of abuse going on and growing up as a kid. So, in, in, a, in a little bit later in the story, it kind of plays, a, you know, a part, and it's kind of relevant to the whole encounter. Yeah. Um, but it started out. Um, we had just moved from Illinois, and my stepfather, he's a Native American Indian, um, and he was married to my mom at the time. And we moved up to North Carolina, and they had a spot where they tore some trees down and put a trailer in. When they put the trailer in, um, the day we showed up, we got out of the car, me and my brothers um, got out of the El Camino and, and my stepfather, buddy, he, uh, he literally looked at us and said, back in the trees, there's a hairy man, stay out of the tree, stay out of the wood. And, you know, us never even hearing those two words in the same sentence, hairy and man, it, it, we kind of, it was more of a, we didn't know what to think of it. And we kind of thought, yeah, whatever. And laughed. And, and he had, you know, he kind of laughed back at us like, well, I told you kind of thing. Um, and we weren't really at this place that long. Um, I know that my, like I said, mom wasn't the best of the moms and she would leave us for day, night, you know, all day, all night, sometimes a little longer. Um, and they left one day and 
I want to say it was in the evening time. It was in the evening, and we were, it was me and my brothers. We were just, uh, once again, the set story with the, with the trailer. The trailer it didn't have any skirting on it. It wasn't even anchored to the ground yet. It had got put in. The plumbing and the, and the electric had all been hooked up um, just the day before we got there. Um, so it didn't even have a porch in the back. It just had a make way shift porch just to get into the front. Um, and so when we were out behind the back of the trailer play and we heard this just God awful scream, um, sounded like a woman getting kind of ripped apart is what it sounded like. It was just a big old bloody curly scream. And so it got our attention and we started walking back. And since this was kind of a newly construction area, they had, you know, to take down some trees and whatnot. So the trees close to the trailer weren't really all that thick. And as we were walking, well, we couldn't have been 25, 50 feet away from our trailer. Um, we weren't looking in the tree. We were just looking straight ahead. There was no reason to look in the tree. The sound of the scream got our attention. And as we were walking in, we were walking and there was a big crack. And all of a sudden, the crack was in the tree and we looked up and the first branch that we've seen, there was, it, and the best way to describe it is literally it looked like probably about a six, six and a half foot chimp. It, it looked, it kind of reminded me of a chimp. Um, it wasn't super buff. It was black, hairy. And, and when we looked up, as we looked up, the way it was standing is if you can picture holding standing next to a flagpole and grabbing it with your hand and then totally extending your arm from the flagpole so you're straight out and then holding on to the flagpole and moving your feet all the way up against the flagpole so you're actually kind of leaning out but your feet are up against the flagpole and your arms totally extended. This is how this thing was and when it went to when it went to stand the branch it was on it broke and it was I'm on, I want to say it was 12 to 15 feet up in the air that was the first branch on the tree when this thing fell west, it, it was all sand and whatnot, so there really wasn't as much of a you know a thud or anything that you would you would think or that would you would recognize. But when would recognize what stood out the most to us is when it landed, the legs barely even bent like it was like for me it was like stepping off a curb. But this thing you know fell out of a tree, 15 feet, and it was almost like it was used to that. So it was mind-boggling to see that when it landed, it barely even bent its legs from the position that it was in me jumping out of a tree, fairly fit guy. I'm pretty sure I'd break a leg or I'd at least fall all the way to the ground. But this thing, it was almost like there was nothing there really to cause any resistance to it. When it landed, it just barely landed is what it looked like. It looked like it was just stepping off a curb on what we would do. Um, when it landed and, we noticed it had an old kind of like a oh crap look in its eyes. It didn't change its face expression except for its eyes. Its eyes got really wide. And us being kids, my brothers, um, like I said, I was six or seven, and my older my other brother was two years older than me, so he was either um, eight or nine, and my brother Bobby was two years older than him, so he was um, ten or eleven, you know, somewhere around in there. Well, we all took off in like a bad out of hell. Um, run into the trailer. Trailer's not that far away. Like I said, maybe 50 feet. Um, that was the day that I realized if I wanted to survive in this family, that I needed to run faster than I did because my brother, Bobby, my oldest brother, Bobby got to the back porch and the back porch was just made out of cinder blocks. Like I said, it's just, just trailer just got put there. They cinder blocks just so we could get up to it. He ran up and he, he bailed on us, man. He, he got up in the house, he shut the door and locked the door and just left us hanging. Um, <laughs> And so me and my brother, Galen, we were uh, right next to the porch was an old freezer chest, but it had a top, like a plexiglass top. And the plexiglass top was very weathered and worn, so it wasn't see-through. It was hazed over really bad. And the only thing we could think of was to jump in there. And and so we jumped in there, and the lid came down. And, um, you know, we were kind of expecting to be lunch after that. We were terrified. I was very terrified. It was very um, traumatic for me. I had lots of lots of nightmares for year nightmares for years after this had happened. Um, to point back to when it had fell and we took off running. One time, as we were running, we glanced back, and when we glanced back, it paused, but it never ran. It never picked up pace. It just walked a curious walk behind us. So we that we just looked back once, and when me and my brother got into the freezer chest, just shut the freezer chest. Um, it walked right up to the freezer chest. We could see a silhouette right through the hazed over 
plexiglass and all it did it i mean it, it could have tapped on the side it could have ripped it apart it could have pulled us out all it did was it it kind of huffed at us kind of like what a horse would do when when they're breathing really hard and they just go it kind of huffed at us and at, at that point i was ready to scream my brother galen kind of got control over me um and it it just walked away. We could hear it walk away, but it wasn't stomping. We just heard it walk away. And, and it was just too hot in that trailer. We, that that uh, freezer chest, we couldn't stay in there any longer. So we came out, reluctantly came out, and my brother Bobby let us in. And that was that was the first experience on, on that night on of, of this encounter with this creature. And it was, like I said, it was, it was very traumatizing. And I think... Um, I think when, when I brought up um, having an abusive um, mother, um, a lot of things in my childhood, memories and stuff, um, just kind of suppressed. Um, you know, bad things get put away, put in a dark spot, kind of forget about or whatnot. Um, I knew after that day that I needed to be a faster runner because my brother Bobby smoked it, and he left us out there hanging. Um, so I became a lot faster. I became a lot faster runner after that. I bet. And you know, the other thing too is, um, I, I just had a show on Friday and the lady was talking about her husband locked her out of the house. He went running for the house. And, uh, so I think there's sometimes a self preservation streak when we're running from fear to where yeah. I'm sure if, um, you know, my brothers would have done that. There would have been a fist fight or something afterwards for doing that. But yeah, um, you know, there. I don't think it was intentional that your brother, or maybe, you know, you're, no. you obviously know your brother better Absolutely. than I do, but I, I think it's self-preservation. You start freaking out and you're not really thinking straight on, on what to do. And so uh, you lock the door I'm behind a, you. I'm a, yeah, I'm 100% with you. I don't think there was any yeah. ill went. Like he was like, yep, it's your day to get eaten. Um, <laughs> it was one of those. I mean, because like I said, we grew up in a very abusive mother. Yeah. And I can't, count the, I can't count them any number of times where my older brothers took the heat, took the rap for something that may have gotten broken around the house because they knew that the beating to come that I may not survive and they've taken it. No, I understand. Um, I understand. So, so I, I don't believe it was anything to really, you know, let us, uh, let us die. It was just one of those things where he was secure in himself. Uh, just the only way he knew how, um, little did we know, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't beeline for us. Like, I mean, and with all my heart, I know it could have had us if it wanted to without really much trouble. Um, it seemed more curious than anything at the most. I wanted to ask you, um, it, before we get into the next night or the next time you saw sure. the creature, which is even more terrifying yeah. than this one. Um, the same night. Yeah. yeah, the same night. But when you when you saw the thing, did it look like a chimpanzee in the face or did it have human-like, um, you know what I'm trying to say, not expressions, yeah, but yeah. What, features? Yeah, kind of features and stuff, yeah. yeah. I, it, from the from the glance that we had, Wes, the the closest thing I can tell you, man, is literally what because we've seen Planet of the Apes as a kid, you know, the original one before all these other ones came out, and 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 to me, that's what that's what it looked like as, as a kid. It it looked like one of the one of the monkeys from Planet of the Apes in the face. There wasn't much there wasn't much hair on the around the eyes and the and the and the lips, but the lips did stick out they 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 were bubbled out if that makes any sense um kind of like a chunk of the lips stick out I, I remember that it it had darker hair thicker hair and I, I, like i said we we only saw it for maybe gosh if you put it all together maybe four or five seconds of the time we saw it up in the tree from the time it landed from the time we took off and then turned back just glanced back to see if we were being chased and then turned around even in more fear. Um, it may be five seconds total. Um, it couldn't have been any more than that, but, but I can, I can promise you that that was enough to, to give me nightmares and think oh, about it for many years afterwards. I bet. Yeah. And I think anyone rational would feel the same way, you know, I mean, my God seeing this thing and, and just being a bunch of kids out there, you know, uh, and, and being, terrified by this thing god i can't even imagine you know what's interesting is i listened to that jimmy and i was thinking uh it must have been a juvenile or something because it doesn't sound like king kong i mean you, you mentioned no, no. this thing was what six and a half feet tall or something maybe it, it, it looked you know my father wasn't very big he wasn't a very big guy i'm actually i'm five eight and i think he might have been five 
I, right now I'm five, but as you know, child I was younger. I mean, he, my, my, I think my stepfather was like five, seven and this thing, you know, like I said, it was never fully standing up straight, but it might've looked six and a half feet, maybe at the most, um, at the very most, you know, and that's me judging as a six or seven year old, you know, the height. Yeah. Um, it wasn't, it wasn't, gin- it wasn't ginormous like the second one. It wasn't not even close. There was, it was night and day. Well, so tell us what happened. So you, you guys obviously get out of the freezer at this point and you go and you talk yeah. to, you guys are all talking. Is there any sort of conversation as far as what the hell was that thing? Um, you know, I think, I think for the first, you know, few hours we were just in fear. Um, I, I honestly, I don't remember much past uh, the, the, the main thing I remember after that. No, I don't, I'm sure we did. You know, I'm sure we did. I just, I just remember later that evening, um, after it had been scared so much that we, you know, we got out one of those old ghost guns that, that flashes a, a ghost silhouette up on the wall with a flashlight, um, yeah. basically a flashlight that has a ghost silhouette. And, and I think we just, we all just stayed in our dark room, just trying to scare each other after that. I don't know if it was a rush as a kid being scared, but then all of a sudden, because I was more freaked out than my, my bigger brothers. I think it became more of a game to them to scare me. Yeah. And so, you know, and, 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 and the one thing the what the one relevant thing I wanted to bring up was, uh, um, the hairy man, the, the, the phrase hairy man. I, I had never heard it prior to that. Never heard it prior to that. Um, never even thought about the words hairy and man being in the same sentence. Um, and then I never heard it after that. And so, um, I don't mean to name drop, but, um, my son, I had told my son, my youngest, my second, the youngest, he's nine. I told him, you know, I was telling him about, you know, what had happened to us when I was a kid. And so he became infatuated with finding Bigfoot. And, you know, we, were, we watched and watched and watched all the episodes, all the seasons. And then one episode they were watching, they were doing a, talking about the Uari National Forest, which is in North Carolina. And they, they literally, um, moneymaker said, you know, the Native Americans around this part, they call him the hairy man. And, and, and when he said hairy man, it was West, the uh, floodgates opened up the, all these memories that were just long locked away, just flooded out. And I, I was just blown away about, about how much I was able to remember how, how it just like, it basically unlocked the door. It was, it was, it was nuts. And, um, you know, and a lot of people aren't fans of, uh, finding big, I, I was a fan of finding Bigfoot until it started getting redundant and, um, but they did, you know, they did kind of thrust the, the subject out there and, uh, in the mainstream a little bit. And, you know, we got to give them props for that at least. Um, no, absolutely. But, I agree with you 100%. It kind of brought it to, uh, the public's attention and however you feel about finding Bigfoot's kind of, mm-hmm. um, you know, it doesn't really matter, but it's, it, yeah. it's, it is, it brought it to, it brought the subject to the public's eye and that's very important. And, and that's cool. Yeah. That's cool that they did it. And a lot of people bash mm-hmm. finding Bigfoot, but you know, like I said, it's, um, it's, it's all we got on TV. Uh, so what happens yeah. that night, that night you guys are in the bedroom and, and, uh, walk us into that evening. Cause it, it gets even more scary. Yeah, absolutely. Um, we just had the trailer put in my um, stepfather, like I said, my stepfather had the trailer put in and if anybody's ever been in a single wide trailer, you kind of know how the setup is, but if people that don't, I'll kind of lay it out for them. You can walk in the front door and the front door, you walk right into the kitchen slash dining room slash living room. Um, and if you go one way on one end of the, when you take a right, it's um, kind of like the master bedroom at one end of the trailer. Um, which is where my mom and my stepfather stay. If you take a left and walk through the living room and start working your way down the hall, the first room on the left was my little sister's. And then the next door was a small bathroom. And then our bedroom was the door at the end of the trailer. So there was um, my three brothers and I, my my two brothers and I shared one bedroom and my sister got a room to herself. Um, She was, she was the littlest. So she was probably, she might've been three or four. And so we're all in the bedroom. My mom, my, my sister, um, I don't know where my sister was. She wasn't with us. I have, I have no idea where she was. But my brothers, we were all in our bedroom at the main, at the other end of the trailer. And outside of our bedroom, when you walk out of our bedroom and you're facing down the hall, to the right is the bathroom. The next door on the right is 
my sister's room, but as soon as you walk out of our bedroom to the left is the back door of the trailer. And that's the, but that's the, that's the door that didn't have a porch. My stepfather just had stacked up some cinder blocks to make a steps to get up and down so we could actually use it. And so, um, you know, one got put in if one is ever going to get put in. I remember the, I remember the, it was, it was kind of a brighter moon night um, because, and my brothers had the, the ghost gone out and they were flashing the ghost silhouette, you know, shining up on the wall. And every time they, they turn it on, we'd all scream, you know, we, we were just boys being boys, scaring each other and mostly them trying to scare me, but you know, I'm kind of um, still a little freaked out, I imagine. And um, so they're shining it and shining it. And I guess it gets to a point to where I'm just, I'm too scared and I'm throwing too much of a fit. And uh, my brothers open up the curtains to let some of the moonlight in. So it wouldn't be as scary. You, you have the lights on and you have too much light and you can't really see the silhouette from the flashlight that's shining an object on the wall. So they didn't want it to be too bright for me to, for, for, to ruin the fun, but give me enough security that I had some light to see what was going on. Um, and when they opened up the, when they opened up the curtain, uh, the moonlight never came in. Um, it was like, there was never even a moon out there. And then my brother was shining the thing and he, he went across the window and keep in mind people that haven't been in a trailer trailers, to get up in a trailer, you got to take three, four, five steps. So it's probably three and a half feet up off the ground, just just to be floor level what we're standing on and what would be on outside. And so when he shined that ghost gun across the window there, um, man, it went it went right across the face, right across the eyes of um, a bigfoot. There's 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 not there's nothing else it could have been. There's there's zero anything else it could have been. The, the shoulders were the shoulder width of it was bigger than our window on the trailer. So we never got to actually see how wide it was, but I know that it was at least four foot wide. Its head was never fully exposed. So its head was still higher than our window. And which explains why we couldn't see any moonlight. The, the damn thing took up the whole window. And when they shine the light across it um, and it went across its eyes, it did the same eye expression is the one that fell out of the tree. Its eyes got really, really big and it kind of moved its lip. And when, when it hit its eyes, I was on the left side of our bed. And when we, when I seen it, I jumped over our bed. I don't think I touched our bed. I landed on the other side, but by the time I had landed on the other side, Wes, that thing was standing in front of the window. It went around the side of the trailer to our back door and I don't know if it had a cinder block in its hand or if it was if it was just that quick, but it grabbed one of those cinder blocks and it threw it through our back door. So when it threw it through the back, the back door was locked, but there was such a gaping bust in the door um, that I could stick my whole entire leg out the door. That's how much force that it used when it threw that cinder block into the back door. And, and, and that was that we it never made a sound. Um, it never peeped the, you know, there, we didn't hear anything, but we were terrified. Um, and we were extra terrified because now we had to look my mother in the face and explain to her how this door is tore up. And we just knew the repercussions to come for that were not going to be fun. It, it, that's what happened. It was this, this one looked completely different than the one we've seen, but it may be because as they, get into adulthood and get older, their facial structures may change somewhat. I do. I, I don't have an answer for that. Um, but it looked like, uh, just a classic drawing of, a you know, a big Brown Bigfoot, a big Brown Sasquatch, you know, anyone, I think you've had sketches on it had it. Um, I do remember seeing white of the eyes. I know some people say that it's all black. Um, I do remember seeing whites of the eyes. I don't remember the color of its pupils. I don't remember any eye shine, which is troubling after hearing a lot of uh, stories where people see eye shine, eye shine, eye shine. We had a flashlight directly in its eyes, and I don't remember any eye shine. Um, I, I might not have been because I didn't stick around long enough to, 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 to see, but I, but I bailed. But um, it, its hair was nowhere near as thick as the one that we see in the tree, it was a lot thinner as far as like, if I don't know, maybe, you know, how dogs have mange and their hair is not very thick. You can see skin 
through their hair because some of their hair is falling out. I remember seeing some of the hair and, and I mean, not some of the hair, but some of the skin, it was huge. It was, there's, there's, there's no, there's nothing else it could have been. And, and that, that's what happened. And then when my uh, mother and stepdad got home, you know, we had to face the music and tell them what happened. And my mom wasn't buying it and she kind of went into a rage and then, but we, you know, we brought it that, you know, but he said it was the hairy man. It was the hairy man. It was here, the hairy man. And I, you know, I kind of remember them getting into pretty much just about a knockdown drag out in the kitchen uh, and about, you know, what had gone on. And then my uh, stepfather kept trying to tell us all that it was, uh, was our nephew or our cousin in a monkey suit. Um, you know, but n- none, none of that makes sense. No, no best athlete in the world is not going to fall out of a tree 15 feet and land and barely even bend their knees once they land um, from the position that they hit the ground. Yeah, and you would have um, known even at that point if it was someone playing a prank on you in a monkey suit. You know what I mean? Well, it's it's well, easier. If, if my nephew, I was just going to say, my nephew was only, or my cousin, he was only, um, it was Buddy's nephew, so I guess it would be my cousin. Um, if He was only maybe a year older than me. And like I said, I was six or seven, and there's no, I'm 44, you know. I work out regularly in pretty good shape, and those damn cinder blocks are still heavy to me. There's no way a six, seven, eight year old is going to pick it up. And if they do pick it up, they're not going to be able to throw it. And if they do throw it, they're not going to have the force to do what the damage did to this door. And so my thought, my thinking is, you know, this was all just a thing to calm everything down, to get the fear to go away. This really wasn't what he said it was. It was really his nephew and, uh, um, and, uh, you know, a monkey suit and, you know, none of it added up. And then, Maybe if we were in my mom's bedroom on the other end where the actual hitch for the trailers, for trailers getting pulled, they have a hitch, you know, and it's, it's on one end. Maybe if it was on that end and there was a couple people trying to pull a plank with a giant costume, but we were on the opposite end where there's no hitch, there's nothing there to get up on, to make yourself look giant. There was nothing there. When, when, when this, when this all happened, um, it, that night, um, we, I remember everybody frantically packing all our clothes, throwing them in garbage bags, throwing them back to the El Camino, and we left that night. Never came back. And the explanation the whole time growing up was it was just my cousin in a monkey suit. I know better. Well, I know if, better. If it was, um, if it was just a kid in a monkey suit, why pack up and leave? And again, that's that's the other thing. If it was our nephew, why not go beat his ass? And, 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 and straighten things out, not not just tuck tail and run. If it was my nephew, you know, why not have him come over and apologize? I'm my cousin. Um, if, if, you know, it, 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 I believe it was all just uh, to try to smooth things over, to not terrify us anymore, to keep us calmed down. But I think I was beyond that point. And when we moved back to Illinois to another trailer court, this uh, – this trailer court had a cornfield behind it and there was just a small tree line that was just that all it was was just a divider of property. The tree line was maybe three trees deep. But for months and months and months, every night I would go out and stare out our back door, staring at this tree line, looking for something to come out of this tree line. It was, um, you know, uh, it, it's, it's, it's beyond baffling how much fear and, and even telling the stories today, you know, when I tell people, I, I'm physically not scared to tell it, but I'm my body's trembling now. If that makes any sense. No, um, it makes complete like sense. Like literally, my my legs, my arms, my body's trembling just telling the story. Yeah. And it, there's there's no rhyme or reason for it, um, other than it, you know that was some real stuff that happened that day. And and I, I never heard of Bigfoot prior to that. When we moved back to Illinois into the other trailer, and I started the school that I started. I, I came across a book in the library, um, and this was, you know, 36 years ago or so. And it was basically about legends of, you know, Bigfoot or Sasquatch and um, oh, the uh, Loch Ness Monster. You know, it was one of those kind of books. And and then, man, when I got that thing, that thing was overdue like nine times. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't take it back to school yeah. because I was so sucked in by what had happened. And then when, you know, like I said, years go by and years go by and you get older, other things come along. And then, you know, when Finding Bigfoot had that episode, 
And he said that he, he said, he said the words, honey, a hairy man. And I, I just, I, I couldn't believe what wave had came over me of, oh my God. Um, and then everything just came rushing back. Everything yeah. came rushing back. Oh, I can imagine. I can imagine for any sane person, it would come back. And, you know, it's interesting, the behavior of the Sasquatch to pick up something and throw it. If you watch a lot of non-human primates, um, and I would imagine it's three kids screaming as you guys are shining the light on this thing, uh, probably startled it, probably took it, was yeah. retreating, grabbed one of those those cinder blocks and threw it and hit the back door. And I'm, and I'm just assuming, I don't know that it necessarily was trying to break into the place. I think it was probably yeah. more or less an accident, but... Uh, I wasn't there to really say one way or another. I wanted to ask you, you said there was differences between the one that you saw in the window that night and the one that fell out of the tree. Was it just less chimp like looking in the face? Correct. Yeah, it, it was it was it was less chimp like. It didn't seem like its lips were bubbling out as much. Um it seemed that its mouth its, its mouth just didn't stick out as much. If that makes any sense, it where its lips are, it wasn't as round like like the first one we've seen. And, and, and so that's, you know, it was one of those things where we were thinking, okay, it threw something through the door, how to get around there so fast to do that, you know, and then we were talking and maybe that other one was out there already with a brick. And I, you know, I, I, I can, I can only speculate, but that, the, the, I literally dove over that bed. And by the time when I landed on the floor, it's about the same time that brick hit the, that brick hit the back door, you know, so that's just a second, a second to make it from standing in front of a window standing. I mean, he had to been he or she, I don't know if it was he or she, but if they weren't standing straight up, they were, they were every bit of eight fall, eight foot tall. If they weren't standing straight up, but if they, I mean, if they were standing straight up, if it wasn't standing straight up, I, I, I couldn't tell you how tall it was. Um, well, and that's, I know it was huge. Yeah. And that's the interesting part is because uh, I know the trailers you're talking about. And if that thing was, let's say, uh, four or five feet across, taking up that back window, you know, without a porch or without something to step up on, I'd imagine the thing had to have been at least nine feet tall to take up yeah. the whole window. Uh, Cause you're right. Yeah, those we, we those windows are high up. I mean, it's not like a, yeah. you know, normal house. Yeah. We didn't get to see its full head. Um, it's part of it. You know, part of the forehead and top of his head was um, not exposed because that was above the window. So we never, you know, we didn't get to see full on head of it. We we saw from gosh, it was um I think all we saw was like from above the nipples to midway up his forehead. And that all took up in when the window. That all blocked out the moon moonlight that night. Do you think and the creature meant you harm that night? Honestly, I, I don't think it did. I, um I think what attracted it to us is you know, there's three boys in a room screaming, trying to scare each, scare each other. And the trailers back in the day weren't made all that great. You know, you hear somebody screaming through a trailer wall from a you know trailer that's you know, 40 years old. I think that might have just attracted it. Or, um, you know, it knew we were already there. You know, like I can't say that if, you know, the juvenile didn't go back and say, yeah, Dad, there's uh, people that are here who aren't supposed to be here. And Dad went and checked it out. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the scenario is. But, you know, it could have, like I said, we were in there and, you know, scaring each other from just seeing me cry, basically. I imagine that's what they were doing. Um, and but we were all having fun, but I was still scared at the same time when we were playing with the ghost gun. And then I just got more and more scared, more and more scared. And then finally I got to where I was just a whiny little brat and they couldn't handle it and gave me some sun, tried to give me some moonlight to show me down. And, you know, and, and, and that's where it all escalated. And, and to, you know, when I've tried, I've tried to talk to them uh, about it and, you know, their response to it was Buddy's answer. It was just our cousin in a suit, you know, and so I just, I, I, I just have a feeling that it didn't affect them like it did me, but there's no way that, I mean, the biggest person, I guess Andre the Giant couldn't have stood there that tall and took up that much room. I mean, he's a big guy. Yeah, and I think what happens is a lot of times, uh, I was just talking to uh, Ed about this, um, you know, I think what happens sometimes when people have encounters, it's easier to pass it off like, 
it's something explainable. Well, it must have been yeah. your cousin in a monkey suit. And I think even if you don't deep down believe that, it's kind of nice to hear that because then you don't really have to address the elephant in the room that obviously right. wasn't your your cousin in a monkey suit. You know, and yeah. you know, and the the whole them saying it was your your cousin, it just seems odd to me that your your folks were like that because you know here's a back window. I, you know, I grew up with brothers and we used to fight. Um, I I've learned how to fight mainly from from growing up with brothers, and I would right. imagine a back back door like that. Uh, there'd be hell to pay if my folks showed up. The three of us were home alone. You know, I actually have seven brothers, but the three of us that we grew up with. Uh, and there was a broken back door, uh, there'd be a lot to explain. And for them to say, well, it must have been this or that, and then they pack up and they leave, I mean, that kind of says it all right there in their actions that uh, yeah. they they knew it wasn't. You know, if some, some kid broke my back window, whether it was my nephew or my cousin, I'm going to go grab him by the ear, drag him back, and yell at him for a while uh, for breaking yeah. my back door. And the fact that they didn't, they just said, let's pack up and we're out of here. Uh, kind of says a lot. And did you have you ever talked to your mom since then? Have you ever sat her down and said, "Hey, listen, mom, let me tell uh, you." No, no, no. Um, just because that relationship has been no, I understand. It was it was such a bad relationship that you know I I tried involving myself um, in my, my 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 birth mother's life, and it was more of a, "Hey, how are you?" can you do this for me within the first five minutes? You know, it wasn't a, Hey, nice to see you. Good to see you. I love you. It was uh, basically, yeah. I, I, we were, you know, we were objects to use and abuse at her will. And it was mostly abused. And so, you know, after trying to just even get a um, verbal relationship after, you know, decades, um, I, I, I gave up and I, I've got kids of my own now and I, they don't need somebody like that in their life. And so, no, I haven't. Um, my stepfather has passed away. Oh, gosh, I don't know. Whatever year it was that Dale Earnhardt Sr. died in NASCAR was the year he passed away because my mother was so distraught when he died. Dale Earnhardt died that she couldn't talk to anybody because her husband was a Dale Earnhardt fan. Um, but so that dictated, you know, a whole year of her life. But no, I, I, I haven't. Um, yeah. you know, I just, I, I remember we, we packed up, I mean, and then that's the other thing too, if, if this was just, it, you know, it, my stepfather wouldn't have the first lines out of his mouth were stay out of the woods because there's a hairy man back there. That's not a setup for a prank for another nine year old, right. eight year old to do on another family of three, um, you know, three other, three other boys. It's, it's, you know, and, and the way he said it, it was no, so nonchalant, like, you know, we know they're back there, but we don't go back there because we know they're back there kind of way. Yeah, no, I understand. I understand. It's too bad it's like that with your mother. Um, you know, this encounter, it's an interesting encounter because you guys, it carried on until that evening. And obviously yeah. there was more than one in the area. And I would imagine that right. would change your outlook as far as going out in the woods and just being out in the woods. I know when you moved to that new place you were talking about, you're constantly, you know, fixated on the the pack of woods behind your house but i'd imagine that even sticks with you as an adult you know having something like yeah. this happen yeah it's as, as a kid it did um i've always liked the woods i still like the woods um i i never even as i got older i never like i said I, the memories were I, so suppressed and locked away because it was just kind of a horrible childhood that it was locked away with you know the fear of the woods and whatnot was locked away with the incident that happened. Um, so I wasn't, I was, you know, never really afraid of the woods, still not afraid of the woods. Um, I like the woods. I'm much older now. I don't really live in any woods, you know, but I sure would like to go back there. I mean, I, you know, the subject, it does consume you when you've had an encounter, you know, I don't know the, the classes of class A, class B, I've heard them, but I've not really paid much attention to what they mean and what they are. But when you have an encounter where you're, Literally, it's on the other side of the wall. They're they're both three to five feet away from you, um, and the only thing blocking you is a freezer chest lid, and a window, and a wall of a trailer. You know, um, it's 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 kind of hard to put that in words, but it doesn't. It no, there there hasn't been any fear. Um, and uh, you know, I had mentioned to you before. I'm a kind of a I'm a, I'm a different breed when it comes to fear. Um, there's not too many, it's going to sound stupid. There's not too many things that scare me or that I, I 
fear, I mean, the main thing I fear, and I'm sure it's all parents, is something happening to my wife and my children. I, you know, that's my main fear. Yeah. I can't stand spiders. That, that's stupid, too. <laughs> They're creepy yeah. little bastards, and there's no place for them. I'm with you. And, and um, I'm, 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 a, I'm a different kind of person. It, it takes a lot. To, and I'm, I had mentioned, you know, if I was to go out to an expedition and – with people and they're wanting to videotape, you know, uh, Sasquatch and they're just out of the wood line and they're acting like they're challenging you. I'm that guy that goes, okay, let's do this. <laughs> you know, I'm the guy that says, yeah, yeah. take my shirt off and does some challenging stuff back just to get the shot, just to get the video, just to get the evidence. Um, and, but again, you know, when, when we, when we had mentioned and talked about the fear and, and whatnot, you know, I'm still sitting here. I'm not, I'm not, I don't, scare easy, but I'm not scared telling the story, but I'm trembling right now. I'm that yeah. guy that's pretty much fearless, but I'm trembling telling you the story. No, I understand. So, um, yeah. I'm not sure, you know, when there's all the talk of um, infrasound and, and, you know, projecting feelings on people, I, I, I don't, I don't get this way, you know, telling other scary encounters where I've had a few car accidents that I should have been dead. I don't get that way telling those, you know, those are, those are legit things that everybody in the world can believe and, and do believe because I have some pictures. Um, and, and I don't get that way. But when I talk about this, you know, I literally it's uh, my body's trembling and there's no rhyme or reason for it. And I remember you talking, I think his name was Rick or Rich. And, and he said that, you know, I don't, I can't, I feel like I'm, a, I'm uh, offending them by trying to go out. You know, I, if he felt like there was emotions projected on him. Um, and that was just like, what, three shows ago, yeah. three shows ago. Yeah. Um, yeah and, you know, that's kind of how it, it's kind of how it feels. Um, uh, there's, there's, you know, no, there's no, there's no fear, no trembling, um, watching finding Bigfoot. There's no fear and trembling watching the mountain monsters. There's no fear and big, uh, uh, and trembling of watching all these Bigfoot movies uh, that I've seen and went out and purchased, you know, um, you know, small town monsters videos and, yeah. and whatnot. Um, there's, there's no, 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 none of that fears there, but man, when I start talking about my encounter, you know, there's not the fear, but the, the, the body reaction, what my body. Yeah. Has, well, like I said, than what my mind does. Yeah. And like I've said before, you know, when you recount an encounter, you know, that's why, uh, I love talking to witnesses because it does take you back in the moment. You do relive yeah. that moment. And that, and that's why there's such tremble and that's why there's such fear is a, it's so unknown, you know, what, what is this saying? And then B, I think that, um, we go back into that moment. We go back, you know, in your situation, you go back to being that kid who saw this thing fall out of the tree, who remembers what it's like to be terrified in that room as this thing standing in the window and then smashes the back door, you go back in those moments and um, it's kind of, um, it's very fascinating to me because anything that's traumatic that's happened uh, and you go back and you start talking about it, you relive it. You're back in that moment. Yeah. Like it just happened yesterday and you're right. There is something different about these. I've been in car accidents. I've been in motorcycle accidents, stuff that, uh, you know, uh, I mean, I could tell you some horror stories, but you don't quite go back into that moment of almost dying in a car accident. And I think it's just because these things are so unknown. It's so odd. It's yeah. so weird. And then when you have something like that happen, um, we tend to kind of compress it inside and it, it lives inside of us. And it comes out in other ways, whether it's nightmares or whether it's drinking or whether it, it eventually comes out. It's, it's our inner demons and going back in that moment of time where that shouldn't have happened. That thing falling out of the tree doesn't exist. It shouldn't have happened. And then coming up to that, yeah. the trailer, that shouldn't have happened because they don't exist, right? Well, right. they do exist, and you do run into yeah. them. And so it kind of freaks us out. But, um, you know, I'm really glad that you came on the show, Jamie. I, I enjoyed reading the email. I enjoyed hearing the encounter story. And you hear a lot of the the um, behaviors that we always talk about on the show. Those are the best yeah. ways to learn about the behaviors from these things is from my witnesses. So uh, yeah. I, I can't thank you enough for coming on and, and sharing it, man. I know you're on vacation too. Thank you for taking the time. Uh, yeah. No. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I, I appreciate it. Um, I um, came across your, 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 your podcast um, while I was, you know, looking at other podcasts and they were just, you know, not to put anybody else down. I don't, I'm not here to do that, but they, 
they weren't even close to years west. Um, I, I heard one episode and then I started binge listening to um, all your episodes and then it started to irritate me because I couldn't get access to the ones that I wasn't a member of. So I became a member so I could get access to those. It, it really is an addictive um, show. And, and more importantly for people that's had encounters, you know, whether it's a sight encounter, whether it's you think one's there, or you hear one, um, your show, man, is therapy. It, it really is therapy that you can't get anywhere else. Um, I, I wanted to thank you for that. I know you get that a lot, but it, it really is because uh, the subject, if you have an encounter, it can consume you. It, it has, hasn't consumed me to where it's all I think about. Um, it, it does consume my free time of when I can multitask. I'm listening to your iPod. And I, I, you know, your, your podcast, I appreciate that. I, I'm going to be going July 8th. Um, I live in Georgia now and in July 8th in North Georgia, there's a Bigfoot museum called Expedition Bigfoot. It's owned by a guy named Dave and it's, it's fantastic. It's a 4,000 square foot, um, facility and he's ever expanding all the time. He's got artifacts from the Yeti expedition. He's, uh, he's got hundreds of casts. Um, hand cast, butt cast, feet cast, you know, um, he's got all the movies and books, all kinds of information. And July 8th, they're going to have a town hall and he's invited me to be a speaker there for, um, you know, uh, um, telling my encounter. And, and that's in, up in North Georgia. Oh, gosh, I can't think, I can't remember if it's Cherry Log or if it's Blue, Blue Ridge. Um, I think it's Cherry Log, it might be Cherry Log. Um, but yeah, Expedition Bigfoot's a fantastic fantastic place and um it just opened about a year ago just over a year ago and that's where i'm going to go with it. but i wanted to you know i wanted to leave you with i appreciate what you do I, I couldn't have got the kind of therapy basically it's therapy i mean I, you might say it's not but it is for for people with encounters and these other podcasts they weren't they were they did they weren't from fulfilling they they, they offered nothing but more of an irritating ir- irritant than anything um you're, you're legit and I, I appreciate you for that thanks brother i appreciate the kind words that's really nice of you you bet next up on the show i want to welcome uh, ed to the show ed thanks for so much for coming on man oh it's been my pleasure and I know you had an encounter when you were younger. Uh, if you would, for the audience, could you kind of start from the beginning, tell us what you're out doing, and, and just kind of walk us into what you saw. Where did this happen to, Ed? What state? Um, it, was in, it was in New England, I'll just yeah. say, uh, okay. sort of a New England area, in the, in the middle of the woods. Nowhere in New England. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. I got gotcha. you. Well, if you would, for the audience, maybe walk us into what happened. Sure. Uh, I was probably around 14, um, and it was the summer of 1985, and we had this very hot stretch of weather, and um, football season was coming up, and I wanted to get into shape, so I I was doing some jogging, uh, and I was usually going in the evenings as the sun was starting to kind of go down, and it cooled off, because it was just too hot to do anything during the day, and down the end of my street, there was this, um, you know, dirt road kind of thing uh, that paralleled some train tracks that would, you know, north up into uh, uh, basically all the way to Canada. There was nothing but but woods. And this dirt road was really not used by vehicles. It was more bikes and joggers. uh, Three wheelers would, would have been not uncommon to see. Uh, on the trail. So I, I was running along this trail um, through this wooded area and uh, probably about three quarters of a mile into the trail, it kind of rises up and passes through this marshy bog area. And it, it, the area kind of looks like uh, some lowlands that flooded and it never actually really drained. So there are some trees sticking up out of the water, some fallen trees, uh, sort of a real boggy, marshy area. And as you approach that area, you kind of come around this bend. So I was coming around the bend in the trail and off to my right, there's nothing but woods uh, for probably ever. And then on my left, um, there's a low lying area with the marsh, a hill going up 
Um, and then beyond that is an area where there's some houses and uh, schools and, and a little bit more of a populated area, which is probably from that point, maybe a half a mile or so away from where I was. It's fairly close. So I come around this bend in the trail and I was became aware of some movement off to my left. And it's an area of the woods uh, where, it, you know, I spent a lot of time on this trail as a kid and uh, there were, you know, deer, you would see deer, bear were not uncommon. Uh, and everybody knew what to do if you ran into a bear. Uh, so it wasn't a fearful thing, but it was something to always be, you know, keep an eye out for. And so I came around the corner and I, I got aware of some movement off to my left and I stopped um, because I, you know, my first thought was, uh, you know, it's a bear. And I kind of stepped out. There was a, a tree blocking my view of what was moving around in the water. So I took kind of a, a quiet step out further into the trail um, to get a look around the, the tree. And um, in the water was something. And my first thought was, well, that's not a bear. And the thing that clicked in my head about that was the size of this. It was, it was just enormous. And the next thought that clicked in my head because of the size was, oh, it's a moose. And, uh, and I, I think the color was sort of like a, a darker Irish setter type of, type of color, sort of that reddish brown. Um, and then I realized in the way that it was moving that, uh, and the, the shagginess of it, that it wasn't a moose. And, what I saw was in the water back to me, I was looking at the back of this animal it was bent over and digging into the bank of the marsh and the arms were in front of it and kind of coming out around the both sides as it's digging with both hands uh, in, in the mud and the dirt was kind of flinging out behind it. And as the arms came backwards uh, i could see that uh underneath the arm down along kind of the torso was this uh, kind of shaggy hair hanging off of it that was again you know, i use the irish setter example it was very much like the underbelly of an irish setter it was sort of hung down like that and i could see um hands uh it, it was just huge and <clears throat> my next thought was you know that's not a moose. And I turned around and I buggered out of there so fast. Um, I ran at full tilt all the way down the end of this trail, um, maybe about three quarters of a mile to, to where the road was. And the, as I'm, as I'm running away, I'm, you know, terrified thinking, oh, this thing's coming after me. And, you know, this thought in my head, oh my God, that was a Bigfoot. And I'm, running down the trail and I, I, I get to the end of the trail and I, I ran so hard. I actually threw up. Um, I started to vomit when I got to the end of the trail and then it wasn't very much further from the end of the trail to my house. So I ran to my house I ran inside, ran up to my bedroom, shut the door and immediately started watching out my window, which overlooked the direction I had just run from. Uh, as I was waiting for this thing to be coming up the street after me. And, uh, uh, the whole encounter probably took, Oh, I don't know, maybe 10 seconds or so. I mean, just enough time for me to understand there was movement to my left to step out, think, Oh, that's not a bear. It's a moose. Then to realize the behavior that I was seeing and the kind of general look of it and think that's not a moose and to see the hands and the arms coming backwards. And it's just, and I just turned and, and bolted out of there. I don't blame you. I would have too. Uh, what was the creature doing? Was it digging? It looked like it was digging and it was back to me bent over. So I couldn't, I, I can't give you a, a, a estimate of the height. And I, I don't know how deep that water actually was. I, n I never went down in there, um, but I could see uh, the back of legs, kind of a, a, a buttocks and, and a bent over torso. I don't know the height, but I'll tell you the width of this thing um, from side to side. I mean, it was just, it was huge. I mean, to, to the point where I, I said it's in my, in my mind quickly, oh, it's way too big to be a bear. It has to be a moose because of the size. I mean, that, that's, that's where my head went immediately because of the size. And, and it, was, it looked like it, it was digging because it, I saw the arms disappear in front of it and kind of swing back maybe two or three times in the amount of time I watched it. 
um, flinging mud and dirt behind it, like, like it was burrowing into the ground. And, um, and that's all I saw. And then I just, I just left. At any point, did the creature notice you? No, not at all. And uh, that I'm aware of, he may have heard, he or she, whatever it was, may have heard me as I, 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 I tore out of there, um, but certainly didn't realize I had come around the corner. And in, in there, you know, it's a, a heavily wooded area and the bend is quite sharp. So it, it might not have heard me kind of coming up the trail um, and maybe making noise in the water itself. Didn't really hear me coming. Uh, and, and the distance, I don't know if I said it was probably about 20 yards. So it's fairly close. Oh, really when I, close. When I turned yeah. that corner. Yeah. And did you tell anyone about this, Ed, after your encounter? Did you ever go back and say anything to anyone? No, ab- absolutely not. Um, until very recently. And, and in, in, as I was telling you, we talked before, when I came home, uh, my mother was in the kitchen and I, I tore right by her. I never told my mother, my father, uh, my siblings. Uh, I never told told anybody about it ever. And I, and I don't know why. I, it, you know, it's the type of thing I've, with the relationship I have with my parents, I, it wouldn't have been an issue. Um, they, they would have been completely supportive and believed me. And it, it wasn't, wasn't anything like that. I just, I, I don't know why I never told anybody. And it wasn't until a very recently in the last year or so that I I felt uh, kind of compelled to start talking about it. Yeah. It's kind of one of those things. And, you know, you're not telling your parents, that's not as, as you and I were saying the other night, that's not as uncommon as people think. A lot of times people don't tell anyone for many years. I've talked to people who have had encounters and 30 years ago never told a soul. And now they're starting to talk about it. So it affects people in different ways. Uh, did it change your mind? I mean, did you ever go back? Did it change your mind as far as going out in the woods? And did you ever go back to that spot? Uh, that's a good question. You know, I went back the next day and I went back on my bike and because I felt like I could go faster on my bike if I needed to get out of there Be- because it w- I just, I, I couldn't process it inside my head. Um, you know, I grew up in the woods and there, I've seen every living creature out there that I thought existed. And to have something be so outside of anything I'd ever experienced before um, was a hard thing to get my head around. So I went down the next day and, and so the way I kind of played it around in my head was that, Oh, you know, it was just a bear. And what I really saw was, you know, one of the fallen tree trunks and that made it look bigger than it was. And I, I probably just imagined the whole thing. And so I went back down the next day on my bike to see just sort of what it looked like. And could, could I have mistaken it for one of the tree trunks or something like this? And so I, when I went to look at the area, there were no trees in the general area where, where I actually saw this thing other than the tree that blocked my view. And I stepped out from behind. Um, and you know, it hit me that what I saw was, was real. And what I had seen, uh, or observed was in my mind, ex- accurate. And what I had seen was something extraordinary in terms of what's normal for that, that area. And I, I started to panic and I, I hyperventilated um, and I jumped on my bike and uh, I just got out of there. And I have, I have never been back down to that spot since. Um, and that's, you know, from 1985, never been back down there. That is very common for us as humans. I did it myself. You have that reaction of, God, was I dreaming? Did I dream that? Did that really happen? And I think everyone who's actually seen one of these things goes through that at some point. Uh, you question yourself, God, did I really see that? Am I am I going? Am I losing my sanity? Uh, and yeah. and, and <laughs> yeah. you know, there was a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, and and I think that's very yeah. common. You know, with a lot of people I talk to, you know, it's that seems to be the number one thing people will say after an encounter is, I, I didn't really believe it. I had to go back, or I had to convince myself. You know, a lot of times people will say, "Well, it was just a bear. It was just a bear. It was just a bear." And then yeah. the more and more they try and sell themselves on it, they know that that's just simply not true. No, I mean, that, that, that's exactly what I did, uh, you know, for many years. I, 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 and I, you know, my background with Bigfoot to this point in my, at, in, up to 1985, my life was really, uh, you know, the $6 million man episode and the, uh, um, in search of, uh, with Leonard Nimoy. I mean, that was it. Yeah, that's all I really knew. I'd seen the, 
you know, the odd clip about Bigfoot, but it wasn't something that was um, uh, something I was interested in, you know, I wasn't, you know, obsessed with Bigfoot like I, I kind of am now. You know, so I, I that's what I did. I, I walked away from it, the, the experience, and just think, uh, yeah, okay, it was a bear. It was a bear. And I spent, you know, my life up until recently saying, ah, oh, you know, it was just a bear. Because it, it's, it's this cognitive dissonance of, of the unsettledness of what you saw being so far beyond what you can explain or understand. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a tough thing to deal with. And I certainly spent a great deal of time trying to convince myself that I'd seen a bear. Yeah, and you hear that a lot with people. You know, and I'm really glad you came on the show. People in the East Coast, uh, especially the Northeast, I've found, uh, it's really hard to get them to come on the show and talk about it. You know, the the main thing I hear a lot from people in the Northeast is, I thought this was a Pacific Northwest problem. Uh, I didn't realize that we had them here. Uh, but I've noticed a lot of people, in the, especially in the Northeast, I don't mean to generalize you guys, but are pretty close, closed off to the subject. Uh, and if they've seen one, it's like pulling teeth to get them to talk about it. And I, as you and I were talking, you know, you get like Vermont, uh, you get in some of those areas. And I get a ton of reports from those areas, but you rarely ever hear them on the show because people from those areas, you know, up in the Northeast, they just don't want to talk about it. Do you find that over there on the East Coast? Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and when, when I started to kind of accept what I saw, um, I, I started, I, I told some very close friends of mine, one of the individuals I, I talked to about it, or two of the individuals I talked to about it still live in that area, um, and frequent the woods. Uh, you know, that's what they do. And so I said, do you guys know of any other stories? Is anybody else, uh, you know, you guys spend your life in the, in the woods. Do you, do you hear anything about this? And because one of the things I wanted is, you know, that my experience, uh, from what I know, looking at you know, the BFRO website, looking at sightings in my general area, there really aren't any. And so I, I felt like I was an N of one and it was a very kind of lonely thing. If I knew of one or two other people who had seen something in the general area, um, you know, it would have been comforting. And they, they both kind of asked around so what they come the the old timers that they work with and everyone kind of scoffed and, and one of my friends said to me, you know, even if one of these old guys had seen a, a Sasquatch out here, nobody would talk about it. Nobody would say a word about it. And, and I think that, um, there's probably a couple of reasons for that. You know, you can generalize some things about new Englanders and that I, they're a very, um, uh, closed group of people. And, and one of the things about us is that I, I always said that new Englanders are a lot like cats. And, you know, you can't just go rushing up to a cat and expect it to be your buddy. You've got to let the cat come to you. And they, they kind of will circle you and the circles will get closer. And then eventually the cat will end up on your lap. I, I think the Winglanders are like that. It's a closed sort of knit society. It's a small town mentality everywhere you go here. And, and, and there's some great things about that. It's a very positive thing in a lot of ways, too. Um, very neighborly, friendly area. But it takes you know, there's that, that wall of privacy here too, that that's unique. I think I've lived in different parts of the country and I, I think it's a, something very unique to, to New England. Yeah, I think so too. And it, I didn't mean to state that the people are bad. I just mean no. uh, regarding, <laughs> <laughs> regarding this subject, they're pretty quiet about it. They're pretty, uh, they're very quiet, about very it. hush hush about it. You know, it's, uh, something you don't talk about. I've talked to so many hunters in the Northeast and who have great encounters. I mean, some of the best encounters you've never heard on the show. And they don't want to come on the show because it, it's not supposed to happen there. If, if Bigfoot does exist, it's supposed to live in Washington, Oregon, or California. Other than that, it's not supposed to be in the Northeast. And that seems yeah. to be the mentality of it. And it's, uh, But you hear great encounters. You know, It reminds me a lot of the people in the South. Uh, they're kind of the yeah. same way. They they'll have they have good, great encounters and they have good information on these things. But some of those backwoods people, man, it's like pulling teeth to get them to talk about what they've seen. And um, I just as the subject opens up and more and more people come forward and and talk about their encounters, like what you're doing, Ed. Uh, I hope more people do that because I, I think witness encounters, despite what some people will say, I think are some of the best examples of trying to get information on what this thing is that's out there running around. 
and you get it from people who've had encounters and it will tell you what they've seen and what they saw the creature doing and what the creature was eating. And uh, you just learn so much from eyewitness testimony uh, until we have yeah. one in a cage that we, we can write down its behavior. This is all we got at this point. And I think it's pretty good to have, you know, get from eyewitness testimony information on these things. Oh, absolutely. You know, and the thing that, that I think, there's a number of things that made me reach out to you. I mean, I've listened to the show for a really long time and, uh, you know, the knowledge of behavior and trying to uh, get an answer to what these things actually are. And I would have had no way to know about this sort of digging behavior, um, that I, that I witnessed. Um, and it wasn't until I, I was watching, um, uh, finding Bigfoot, and they were interviewing a witness, which are, I think you know one of the best parts of the show are the witness accounts. And oh yeah, I agree. And this 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 guy was talking about uh, seeing one of these creatures digging in a uh, the edge of a pond or a river, I forget which. And the idea being that they dig down into the mud for frogs as a source of protein. And and uh, when I saw that on TV, it was like getting hit in the face with a basketball, and there was absolutely no denying at that point for me, what I had seen and, you know, that type of behavior, the, the bent over digging in the, the banks of, of the swampy area, you know, just, it, it was such an unusual thing to see. Uh, I've never seen an animal do that. And, and that always sort of was one of the things in my head that I couldn't rationalize. Why would it be, why on earth would it be digging in the side of this swampy area in the mud and what's it doing? Is it, why, what's the point of that? And um, it was that that corroboration of of what I had seen and and, and, a, and a rationale behind it, looking for protein, that that was uh, that really that really struck me to to own up to to what I had seen. Yeah, and I've I've talked to witnesses before that have seen them digging. Uh, as you and I were talking the other day, I had a witness on one time. She thought it was a bear cub, yeah, because she saw it from behind, and she said it was digging. And as she slowly approached it. Um, it actually turned around and looked at her and she said, that's not a bear. And I asked her what she thought it was doing. She goes, I, I don't know if it was eating worms or if it was trying to like get little grubs or whatever, but it was digging in the dirt and seemed to be every once in a while putting something up towards its mouth. But she saw it from behind. And uh, so you hear that behavior. Like I said, you hear that behavior from a lot of witnesses where you catch them in the act of doing something. Um, it's like I had the lady from uh, Manitoba on and she was talking about you know it walked out to the lake and was standing out there pooping in the lake um and yeah. so it's it's kind of interesting to hear certain behaviors from these things and you really get that from from my witnesses but um i really appreciate you coming on it i really appreciate you taking the time to uh, share the encounter I, I know it's it's tough to come out and talk about it uh but i really do appreciate you coming on and and taking yeah. It is, but but you know what, Wes, and we have something we touched on the other night too is that uh, one of the things that that I, I didn't realize was was happening with me was I don't remember when they started, but I know that they've it was since 1985, and while I was still uh, a teenager, I started having horrible, horrible nightmares about Bigfoot um, multiple times a year. I mean, sometimes it was you know once a month, and they it, it paralyzing night terrors. Um, and I, I never, I didn't put two and two together. I never knew why these were happening. I remember, you know, years ago telling my wife about them and, and, and just being, I don't know why I have all these horrible, I mean, terrifying dreams about Bigfoot. I mean, what is this about? And, and um, once I started talking about it and telling a couple of friends and some, and my fam, some people in my family about it, the nightmares stopped and I haven't had one in, you know, a year, over a year since I started talking about this. And so that acceptance of finally, you know, coming to grips myself with what I saw is a, is a very, a very important thing that, that happened. And certainly listening to your show has been a big part of that. And, uh, you know, I, like I was telling you the other night, listening to the show, it, it, it is sort of like a support group. You know, we, we are all kind of there for each other with these stories that, that we can't take any place else. I mean, I, I was telling you, I'm a scientist. I'm a physician, and you know, if, if I were to start telling you know people about and you know what I saw, that would it, it would it could you know do some professional damage, 
um, to my career. And that was something I think in the podcast last week that, that inspired me to reach out to you as well as the lack of credible scientists who have seen these things that are willing to come out and say, Hey, I saw something. I don't know what it is. We should go find out. And it's a shame that, that with the scientists that, you know, our job is the truth and to not be able to tell the truth is a very uncomfortable situation. Yeah, no, it is. It is. And uh, I'm assuming you're referring to the Dr. Ben Arnoggle episodes that I did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was such a great interview. Yeah. And, and he, you know, uh, Dr. Ben Arnoggle actually hit on a lot of the points, you know, as far as why science doesn't really look at the subject. Everyone, you know, and he hit it right on the head when he said, you know, everyone thinks scientists are open minded and they're searching for answers and searching for truth. And, um, you know, I don't want to beat scientists up too much, but that's not really true. Uh, you kind of fall yeah. fall yeah. into line to the agenda that's already been presented. And if you think outside of the box, then you're looked at as kind of, you know, they raise the eyebrow. At you like, what you know, what are you what are you doing? Uh, let's exactly. let's go with what we know here. And that's a shame because that's not really what you when you think of science. That's not really what you think of. You you would think that they would be open minded. They'd be looking outside of the box for answers. And um, as you and I talked, you know, there's a lot of different professors that actually listen to the show. And one in particular, that's a primatologist. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he, um, you know, he's he's like, hey, I the more I listen to these encounters, he's like, it almost seems almost seems more ridiculous in thinking everyone's delusional and everyone's lying. That's almost more outrageous to think that out of all these people than they're actually seeing something. The fact that they're probably seeing something makes more sense than everyone's just delusional. And I really wish more scientists would look at it, you know, look at it at that point, you know, not saying you don't have to believe in Bigfoot, but, you know, just take a look at it, you know, and there's nothing wrong with discussing it and looking at it. And I just wish more would do that. Yeah, and you're right. And, and it, it is a, it is a science problem. And it, if you if, if you you would look at it in one end of the spectrum is like, what's what's the big deal? We're talking about identifying a species of North American great ape. Why is this so hard to pe- for people to get their, get their heads around? And then you have the, you know, we talked about the other night, the, those, the other end of the spectrum where you almost go into the paranormal with, with Sasquatch and, and some of the more unusual uh, descriptions of behavior or uh, you know, other aspects of, of the mysti- mystical almost Bigfoot. And I think that's the problem that scientists have is uh, having to deal with that end of the spectrum because it's, you know, the paranormal necessarily it isn't necessarily something you can, you can measure. It isn't something you can, you can put in a lab and control and try to uh, study it and understand it. And I think, you know, when you start mixing paranormal features to the existence of something, then it becomes a much less attractive thing for scientists because as soon as you start going down that road, uh, then, then you're, you're nuts. And that's unfortunate. And I get that. I completely get that. And I can understand that from a science point of view, why they wouldn't want to touch that because how do you measure? It's like chasing a ghost. You know, how do you, how do you measure that? You can't measure that. Um, and, but there is enough physical evidence to, to show that something is out there. You can put all the paranormal stuff in the back of your head, but, and just look at what's nor- what we would call normal. I mean, the footprints, the audio and some of this other stuff and the witness, I, te- you know, eyewitness testimony and, you know, take a look at it, you know, and I agree. And, you know, sometimes on the paranormal stuff, it's kind of like, well, I don't know. Um, but after a while, when you start hearing stuff over and over and over and over again from different credible people, you're not really sure what to make of it. But, you know, I, I really and I and I can appreciate why scientists wouldn't want to get involved in that. It's like why scientists aren't involved in, um, you know, ghost hunting. Uh, I, I would imagine it wouldn't be that hard to prove to someone demons are real uh, if you really wanted to, to show them. Uh, but the problem is, is you can't measure it. You can't put it in a lab. You can't write down this. You can't write down that. It's more of just of a, a experience. And yeah. I don't know why I'm going off on that tangent, but it no, just but, gets. Fr- but, but that's important. Yeah, it just gets frustrating after a while for them not to look into this. You know, there's enough people that have come forward. There's enough cops. There's enough credible people that have come forward uh, that have had encounters, 
And what's interesting is that everyone kind of says the same thing. You're not one one person really isn't that far off from a ne- from the next. And you're talking about completely different geographical areas of the United States, for example. And you got a huge range of people that are seeing this thing. And it's not, yeah. you know, it's not as cool as everyone thinks to have a Bigfoot encounter. I think most people who've had encounters probably wish they would have never had an encounter. Um, so it's not the cool thing to do to come forward and say, hey, I've had an encounter. Uh, it takes a lot of balls to come forward and say, hey, I saw this thing. I don't know what it was, you know. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, and that, and you did, I think you hit on another really important point uh, where a lot of people wish they had never seen this thing. And, you know, if you'd have asked me a year or so ago, you know, I wish I'd never seen this thing. I wish I'd never had gone jogging that night. I wish I'd never, uh, never seen this. And, um, but now it's different now that I, I feel okay about what I saw and, and, and able to talk about it a little bit. I think, um, I wish I'd stayed there a little longer, <laughs> you know, you know, yeah. I'll never see one again. Um, I'd love to see one again because I really want to know what these things are. And, you know, that, that's the scientific curiosity that now I've, you know, the idea of, well, I have, I have to understand what I've seen scientifically because that's how I operate. Um, I I wish I, I wish I could see it again and go back in time and stand there and, and see what would happen if it noticed me. See if I, you know, go down the next day and actually look for tracks. I didn't do that because I I didn't even think about looking for tracks. It never even crossed my mind. I would, and then by the time it hit me, what I had seen, I just wanted to get out of there. I started to panic and I had to, you know, is the thing still here? They're going to lunge out of the woods. And I, I just get out of there. But, you know, today I probably would respond a little bit differently, particularly now that I've been able to process it um, in a way that I think is, is, is healthy. Well, and it's, it's, uh, that is the question, isn't it? What is this thing? You know, I talk about shooting, yeah this thing all the time and, and people get so upset. I mean, you wouldn't believe some of the crazy emails I get uh, and yeah. me- messages I get um, with people who are so irate over that. I'm not saying shoot it for my benefit. I'm saying shoot it for the public's benefit, for science's benefit, for the being, for this creature's benefit. It's not so much that it needs to be proven in my eyes because I've seen it. I know they exist. It's I want to prove it for, I want the general public to know it's out there. But that is the question. What is this thing? Uh, for me, it's not so much trying to prove it. It's what is this thing? And I wish I had the answer to that. Well, I think that uh, you're, you're right. You know, I, mean, I don't hunt. I never, I've never hunted uh, seriously because I, I, and when we, where I grew up, a deer would come right up to your house. And if you wanted to hunt, you could sit in your back porch. And they would eat out of the garden. They, would, you know, they were always there. And they're just be- such beautiful animals. And I, I just, I never hunted. I never wanted to shoot anything, kill anything. It was, it was never, because of that close proximity to the animals, I, I always felt, you know, some sort of, uh, uh, you know, fondness for them. They were just so beautiful. And I never wanted to kill anything. And I understand why people hunt. And I, I think it's an important part of culture. And I have friends that hunt. I never would cr- criticize it in any way. Um, but killing a Bigfoot, um, you know, not for sport is, is, you know, what is how we species type. And, you know, you go to animal collections all around the country and different natural history museums, and they are the species type identifier uh, everywhere from birds to small mammals. And that's how you identify a species. And if you can identify the species, um, you can better understand it, see where it falls in line with the evolutionary scale of, of primates and uh, and then if you need to um, protect the species you know your your argument for having a, a body is is not unreasonable for science and it isn't you know a sport of killing bigfoot it isn't to take a a, a corpse around and to like a, a circus at a peep show um, yeah. it's about trying to protect the species and understand what it is and uh, I you know I think that you know, you never condone the killing of anything or anyone, but when you're, when you're trying to identify a species, you you have to, uh, you have to be able to, to study it. I, I don't think that's unreasonable. Yeah. I don't think it's unreasonable either. And, you know, a lot of these big footers, they cry 
uh, about that, you know, as far as people talking about killing one, but it, it has to be done. It's just the way it is. You, you want to talk science in one hand, but then you think it's wrong to collect the specimens in the other hand. And it, it doesn't make sense. Your, your arguments are way off. Either, either it is or it isn't. If you're for science and you're for science looking into this, then you have to be for collecting a specimen. Um, otherwise, what are we doing here? Why, why are we bother looking into this? Um, rather, you know, we want to prove it. That's the reason why we look into it. And hopefully more and more people will come forward with their encounters and, and take the time to come forward with their encounters like you have, Ed, and share it because we get so much information off of that. Until we have a, a specimen, a collect, spe- you know, until we collect a specimen, uh, all we can go off of right now is the the evidence we have with footprints and audio and stuff people are collecting and witness eye testimony is a piece of that. So I really appreciate you coming on, man. I really enjoyed talking with oh, you. Oh, no. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. I appreciate the podcast. Like I said, it's been a great uh, a great resource for me to kind of process uh, what I what I went through. And uh, I think that's true of a lot of people who listen and never reach out to you. And certainly true of the people who do reach out to you. I, I hope you get more people from New England willing to talk about it now. I, I think uh, I'd love to know what's really going on up here in this part of the world. Because, I, I, you know, the Appalachian Trail coming right through here. I mean, there's a, a super highway of forest. And um, I'd love to know. No, I'd like to, too. Thank you so much, Ed, again, for coming on. I really appreciate it, man. Oh, you're very welcome. Thank you for the time. And, again, I really appreciate all your work, Wes. And that's it for tonight, everyone. Remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance, please visit sasquatchchronicles.com. Until next time, everyone. 